Good morning. My name is Pastor Pete from the O'Connor Gospel Chapel. Well, last week we had our first opening. It was great to be together as the body of Christ. And if you're listening on WOCO this morning or on, on, on YouTube, we welcome you to come to church. And if you can't come to church, keep on listening to us each Sunday morning, uh, 9 o'clock on WOCO. Well, this morning, as we go into our text, John 12, 1 through 8, there's a question that comes to mind. What do you think or how would you define extravagance or being extravagant? What comes to mind? Well, if you look up the word extravagant, it means excessive, wasteful, unreasonable, overgenerous, excessive. Now, when you think about extravagant, and you think about what the Bible says, it has a negative press attached to that word. Probably sinful, extravagant living. When you think the Bible speaks of that as wastefulness, Luke 15, 13, the story of the prodigal son, what did he do? He wasted his inheritance. Proverbs 21, 20 says, contrast the wise with the foolish when they say with handling money. In the house of the wise are stores of choice food, but the foolish man devours it all. Extravagant lifestyle, spoken of in Proverbs, is described as drunkenness, even gluttony. And it says in Proverbs, do not join those who drink too much wine or gorge themselves on meat. Now that you have this idea, this negative connotation to the word extravagant, think about it this way. How about if we blend or marry the word extravagant with worship? What would you be thinking? Extravagant worship. Well, if you have your Bibles, turn with me to John chapter 12. And before we do that, let's ask the Lord to bless our, the message and our time together. Father, I thank you for your text here today about Jesus and Mary and Martha and Lazarus and uh, even Judas Iscariot, Lord, I just thank you for this text today and what it teaches us about who you are and what you want us to do with our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. So if you have John chapter 12, verse 1 through 8 open, I'm going to be reading from the NIV. Now it says, six days before the Passover, Jesus arrived at Bethany. Six days before the Passover. Well, we know that this is, this is the last stretch before Jesus is on the cross. Chapter 12, then you, you have the washing of the feet. Then you have other things taking place. But as he's getting closer and closer to Jerusalem, that triumphal entry. And so that Jesus arrived at Bethany. Bethany was his go-to place. Because that's where Lazarus was. That's where Mary was. That's where Martha was. But notice what John says about it. He says how he defines it. Where Lazarus lived, whom Jesus raised from the dead. You know how important that is? I don't know if you remember Billy Graham crusades or even any evangelist. They usually have somebody to start it off with an introduction of their testimony. And, and people come to hear that testimony. Could you imagine Here's Lazarus. What's his testimony? Nobody else ever rose from the dead other than Jesus. Here is Lazarus. He was dead. Now he's alive. That's a drawing part. Now he says here a dinner was given in Jesus' honor. Where was Jesus located? He was probably at Simon the leper. Is that what some people think? He was Simon the leper. And that's where he was located. That's where he was having this, this supper this, uh, in his honor. Why? Because Lazarus, or not Lazarus, but Simon, was, was a leper. And here is another thing. Leprosy kills you. Jesus touched Simon, and he was made whole once again. But then it says... And now it starts listing up the people. Martha served. That's her, her point of reference. That's her strong point. She was asked to serve, so she did, and she served Jesus. 
while Lazarus amongst those reclining the table with him. Think of this. Again, we have to say, Lazarus was right next to the one who they were honoring, which was Jesus. That's a, that's a, a great position to be in because people are watching. People know what took place. His disciples knew what took place. Simon heard about it, and now he sees Lazarus. He's alive. But then verse 3. Then Mary took about a pint of pure nard. What is pure nard? Spike nard. Where does that come from? It comes from northern India. So that's part of the expense that, that Roman soldiers probably transported that. And somehow it came into the possession of Mary, maybe as a gift, maybe as something that she was supposed to save until maybe she got married or maybe when she would have her living, she, that, would, that would be something that she would have done. It was kind of her, her safety net. And it says expensive perfume. And notice what she does. She pours it on Jesus' feet. Notice that other times we see Mary at Jesus' feet listening to Jesus while he taught, as he was teaching. But now she is taking the form of a very humble servant because the only people that washed people's feet when you got into the home were servants, and that was a lowly position. But that was a position that Mary was in. But notice this. This probably got the eyebrows going, kind of got a little murmuring taking place, and, and wiped his feet with her hair. It was long hair. And you know, when you think of it, it's the beauty of that hair. And that was a part of who she was, and so she wiped Jesus' feet. And notice after that she had broken that, uh, that expensive perfume, there was a aroma that filled the entire house. Everyone could smell it. It was beautiful. And so we see that that was what Mary did, was one of sacrifice, one of service, one of love to her Savior. But notice the but. Here's the contrast. And this is what John brings up. But one of his disciples, now he outs him as Judas Iscariot, who would later betray him. What a title. What an identification. But notice what it says here. He objected. He objected to what they or what she was doing. Notice what he says. Wasn't this perfume? It wasn't this perfume sold and the money given to the poor? Boy, that sounds so noble. So we're like, wow, what a guy! He would take all this money and he would give it to the poor. And and when I think about it, yeah, that would be great. But notice what Judas says. He, remember, he's, he's the accountant. He's the financier. He says, this was worth a year's wages. He knew that. He knew it was expensive. He knew the price. But John says, he did not say this because he cared about the poor, but because he was a thief. Think of that. He was a thief. My goodness. Then it says, he used it to help himself to what was put into it. He pilfered. When he needed something, he took it from that, that offering. And remember, the money that was in that bag was to, to provide for all of his disciples and Jesus as they did their ministry. He was pilfering that. Now, Joe, notice Jesus' um, Rebuke. It, it, it's right at Judas's. Leave her alone. Jesus replied. And then he tells everyone and Judas why this was done. It was intended that she would save this perfume for the day of my burial. Remember now what's coming up. His death his burial, his resurrection. And he says, she's going to anoint me. So she anointed his feet. 
But then notice what he says. You will always have the poor with you, Judas. But you will not always have me. Wow, isn't that something? Now, when I think of this story, and I blend the word worship with extravagance, I discover this about extravagant worship. It isn't about the style that you choose to worship or the preference that you choose to worship. Because those are always can be at odds with people. Some people are too vocal. Some people are just too quiet. Some people raise their hands. Some people say whatever in during the worship. And, and there's always those that say, well, that's just too extravagant. That's too much. And there will be others that say, well, that's not enough. But what we find out, it's not about your style or your preference. It is a heart issue. Because if you notice Martha and Judas, notice the contrast of their extreme worship and what how extreme Judas was. Martha was a servant. She loved her Lord. That was extreme. She did everything that she could do to show her love. And Judas thought Mary's worship or whatever she did with that, that, that expensive perfume was extravagant. It was excessive. It was over the top. We could have sold it for the poor, but really he wanted to steal it and be using it on himself. So if we were going to give a picture of what extravagant worship looks like, we have four things that we can say. Well, extravagant worship looks at, can be spontaneous. You see, when you look at verse 3, the verse, the word then. See, Martha thought about it right away and she did it. She acted out on that. And it was before everyone to show her love for Jesus. Extravagant worship is about loving the Lord to, to, to no matter who's watching you. No matter if people label you as extreme or over the top or fanatic. Doesn't matter. However, you worship him, you give your all to him, it is going to be, should be spontaneous. That doesn't mean we aren't to be disciplined, but it means spontaneous, being spontaneous when the moment hits you. And what I mean by that is when the spirit moves you to worship and to give, do it spontaneously. Don't let the Holy Spirit keep on nudging and bugging you, push you, say, come on, come on, come on, let's do that. And he doesn't want that. He wants you to be spontaneous because it shows your love for Jesus. But extravagant worship is another thing that we can say is very expensive. It was very costly. Again, we've noted that. But did you know how much it cost her? Think about it. That was her security net. That's, ten, that's a lot of money for this woman to have. Now, it does note that the family was very wealthy. But we don't know how Mary obtained this, but it was hers. And it could be sold. And, and guess, you know, when you think of Judas, he knew the, how much it was worth. It says it's worth 300 denarii. Now, that doesn't mean much to us today because we don't know what a denarii is. But we do know if we look at it in modern day's term, it would be like uh, one denarii is $4 an hour or $4. Then you think about what it would be over a year, $10,000. Now think about that kind of money in Mary's day. That would meant that she was wealthy. And here she breaks that and pours it on Jesus' dusty feet. See, extreme worshipers, they don't think about the cost. Not only are they spontaneous, but they give everything they have to Jesus. You see, Jesus says, if anyone's going to follow me, anyone who wants to be uh, among my followers, you must give up your way of life and take up your cross and follow me. Did you notice that? To give up your life. See, that's expensive. Some of us may not want to give up our life. Some of us just are just happy being religious or going to church. But Jesus said, if you're going to be my follower, you've got to give up your way of living. That is really true, because no matter what you give to Jesus, how you show your love to him, he will never reject it. He will receive it completely and totally. So we have spontaneous worship or ex extravagant worship is spontaneous. It really is expensive. 
but spontaneous worship will be misunderstood. Now think about that. Here's Mary, young woman. And here she comes in this room. And she pull, she allows her hair to be down and she is going to show her humble act of service by wiping his feet with her hair. Now, could you imagine the people around the table, all the guests, their eyes were just centered on what she did. She not only broke that perfume, all of it all over his feet, but now she's using her hair. Now, when you think about the days of Christ, a woman's hair was her beauty, was her glory. But her hair, if she was married, was put up and there would be a veil. And why would they do that? Because the only person that was to see her beautiful hair was her husband. Now, we don't know if Martha was married or not, but her hair was down. And boy, I tell you, people were looking at that and they were probably saying to one another, what is she doing? If you're going to say, boy, that's over the top. That's embarrassing. That's wow. How could she do that? But she did it nonetheless. You see, Mary just didn't just have a give a pinch of this, uh, of this oil, anointing oil. She gave it all. Now think about this. Think about it. Even though she was sharply criticized for what she did, she was sharply criticized by maybe some of the disciples, maybe some people in the room. But for Mary. She risked being misunderstood. Her devotion was, I love you, Lord. I don't care who's watching. See, let me just say, if you're an a, a, a ex, ex, extravagant worshiper, you will be misunderstood, and you will be misunderstood maybe by brothers and sisters in Christ who don't understand your over-the-top service to God. Some people may say, well, that, that's just way too much. Who does she think or who does he think he is? You know, this is supposed to be a private thing. This is supposed to be something we do privately before the Lord. But see, but for Martha or for Mary, she did it openly. And, and if you, however you worship or the way you serve, or the way you give, there will always be people who will say, that's a little bit too much. Wow. It is, and it will be misunderstood by people. But are you willing to pay that price? Are you willing to be labeled a fanatic? Someone who doesn't matter who's watching, who's there. You don't care what they're thinking. All you care about is that it's to Jesus Christ. So we see that it is spontaneous. We see that it is expensive. We see that it will be misunderstood. The last thing we see is it will be sacrificial. Her worship was giving it all. The house was filled with fragrance. That tells us that Mary did not just use that pinch or that little bit. She used it all. And think of it. She broke that container and gave it to Jesus. See, the aroma of Christ will eh, that comes from her service was honoring him and let me just say to you we are that device we are that va vase or whatever that oil was in and what jesus is asking from you and from me will you be willing to be broken and give it all not not just some of it not just a little bit of it see the aroma of christ will come from you, from me, and people will be refreshed. But guess what? You can't have a heart, half-hearted devotion. You, you can't just give half of your pocketbook. You can't just give half of your talents or half of your ambitions or half of your, your heart to the Lord or, or half of your boyfriend, half of your girlfriend. Think of that. You know, you want to keep her or him to yourself, but God says, give her to me. That's the same thing with husbands and wives and children. And children giving them their everything to the Lord. So if you're an, a, an extravagant worshiper, you will be willing to be broken open and poured out for his service. Regardless of the cost, 
regardless of being misunderstood, regardless of how spontaneous it is. You're doing this to honor Christ. And when you're broken like that, and you're serving God, I'm not just talking about worship and singing and, and, and stuff, or reading scripture. I'm talking about in our service to God. When you are broken and given to him, he will be honored. Well, there's a story I want to tell you. It's a true story, and it's, a, it's an interesting story. It's about a nine-year-old boy who lived in Tennessee. He lived in the very poorest community of Tennessee, and the church down the block had a bus ministry. And so one Saturday afternoon, this guy, this bus pastor, uh, he, he came to the door, and he knocked on this this door and no one no one was answering so he knocked again and here comes this little boy and he's he's talking to him and the bus uh, pastor says uh, are your parents home he says no my parents aren't home they're going for the weekend I'm taking care of my brother he he had to think about that he really didn't understand he said he says let me get this right you and your brother are home alone for the weekend while your parents are going and he says yep that's right Bus pastor just couldn't believe it, but that's what he said. Then he asked if he could come in, and the bus pastor, he came in, and and their their furniture was, you could see that it was dilapidated. The springs were coming out of the out of the couch, but that's where they sat. And so the bus pastor said, Have you ever been to church? The little boy said, I've never been to church all of my life. All of my life, nine years old, and he said, I've never been there. Don't even know what it is. And so the bus pastor, again, thought, well, that's strange. And, you know, the, the, the church is only three miles down the road. Why hasn't he been in church? But then the bus, bus pastor said, well, son, what's more important than going to church? Boy, he didn't know. He says, would you mind if I tell you about the greatest love story ever told? The little boy was really, really, really uh, spontaneous. He wanted to hear it. So he said, yeah, let me hear it. So the bus pastor told him about Jesus, told him about the gospel. And, and the bus pastor says, would you like to receive God's free gift? And he says, yeah. So they got on their knees and he prayed and asked Christ into his life. And so the bus pastor says, uh, I'm going to pick you up on Sunday morning early and bring you to church. So that morning, bus pastor came, knocked on the door. Nobody was there. The house was dark, everything. And he uh, took the doorknob, and, and it was open. And he, and he walked through the through the place, and uh, he was trying to find the kids. And they went to the, he went to their bedroom, and there t t lied the two little boys still fast asleep. So he woke them up, got them stressed, took them to church. What's interesting is that as he got to church, this little boy, he was sat somewhere in the middle. It was a big church, and he was bewildered. He didn't know what was going on. He's looking all over the place, wondering what's taking place. And then he saw all these tall, grumpy-looking guys with wooden plates. He said, what is that all about? So he saw these pigs going up and down the aisle, and it hit him. They're giving something to Jesus. So before this plate could come, he's checking his pockets, his back pockets, his front pockets. No money at all. So when the plate got to him, he held on to it, but he had to give it back. And so he went down the road, about eight rows back, he was watching. He, he says, ah, I know what I'm going to do. So what does he do? He gets out of his chair in front of everybody and goes up to the usher, he says, can I have that plate? Now, you can imagine how misunderstood people would be there at that moment. And, and there, he, he says, the, the, the usher said, sure, take the plate. So he took the plate, put the plate down on the carpeted floor. And then he did something so amazing. Everybody's watching. Their eyes are all on this boy. He stood inside of that plate. And he says, Jesus, I have nothing. But I give you me. If that is an extravagant worship, I don't know what it is. I think that little nine-year-old boy and, and Mary would have gotten along really well. So what is extravagant worship? It's spontaneous. Just like that little boy and just like Martha or Mary, it was spontaneous. It was costly. It would cost. It would cost both of them. 
it'd be misunderstood and it was misunderstood you could probably see like with mary what she did with pouring out all that all that beautiful perfume and then uh, taking her hair wiping jesus feet and here's this little boy who who takes this plate that people are saying what is this little boy going to do he looks poor he's going to take off with it they misunderstood him he put it down and he was sacrificial he broke his life open to say i am all yours so this morning Let's just take the next few moments to say, Lord, help me with my worship and let it be extravagant. Dear Lord Jesus, I thank you that for the story of Mary and the story of this little nine-year-old boy, help us to be those kind of people that don't regard the cost. We'll do it whenever the Spirit prompts us. We'll be able to be people who say, yes, Jesus, I'm willing to give it all. In Jesus' name, amen.